My name's Greg. I'm David. Hello. Uh, we're from Reason Digital. Uh, we jumped in last minute. Um, luckily, David's done this presentation because normally when I jump in last minute for Bex, there's lots of swearing in my presentations. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today is a project that we worked on with some partners. Um, it was an MVP project. It was a prototype, um, an app. Um, and we're going to talk through some of the steps that we took to produce this, to test this, um, and talk about where we're going next. Um, so it's the Fall Prevention app. Um, I, probably you don't know much about uh, falls in the elderly. Um, but the University of Manchester, um, there was Emma and Paul who were doing a research, a feasibility study. And there's a lot of interest in the NHS currently into self-care and reducing the burden on the NHS and reducing costs on the NHS. Um, so they've done some research, um, done a review study of research that's already out there. Um, believe it or not, falls are the largest cause of accidental death in um, the over 65s across Europe. Um, also, 30 to 50% of older people fall at least once per year. 30% um, for those over 65, 50% for those over um, 80. Um, and if you tie that back to the last slide, that's a lot of opportunity for risk. Um, and it costs 2.3 billion a year to the NHS through direct and indirect costs. Um, and one of the biggest problems with this is that it's not a recognized issue, particularly amongst the people that tend to fall. Um, when we started this app, they referred to, we call it the Fall Prevention App, but in actual fact, it's not called the Fall Prevention App because there's a very big reason for this, that when you mention to an elderly person, oh, we need to talk to you about falling over, they go, oh, no, no, I don't fall over. I, I, I've never fallen over. It's not a problem that I have. That's, that's what happens to old people. Um, so they realized that they needed to approach this in a different way. They needed to do something that would take that away, that, that focus on falling, and focus more on general health, um, kind of uh, risk management and education um, and tackle those kinds of elements in a way that was more entertaining rather than um, some of the more staid and boring NHS kind of approaches. And here's an example of um, some documentation which w they gave to us, which was an example um, this was done by, I think it was an Australian um, research team looking at uh, the types of exercises that could be, that carers could teach to the elderly to uh, prevent falls and obviously a lot of use of chairs and kind of low level exercise. And this is obviously really, really thrilling stuff. Um, it's really exciting and when we saw it we just jumped for joy. Um, but the content there is really, really important. But they knew that they needed to do something new, something fresh that would actually take that message to their audience. And bizarrely, their thoughts were, firstly, an app. Secondly, gamification. Now, a lot of people here will probably, or a lot of people out in the general public will think, what an app for the elderly? Gamification for the elderly? They, they, they're not interested in that. Jesse, one, one of our team, would hit you for saying that. Um, because there's a lot of research that shows that the elderly are interested in using mobile technology, they are interested in games, they are interested in apps. Um, so we kind of said, yeah, we think this is a great idea, we think it's a fantastic project, we think it can have a huge impact on a global audience, not just people in the UK. Um, but it's always difficult to, to say when you, someone comes to you with a great idea, it's very easy to get caught up in that initial, this sounds like a brilliant idea, let's just do it, let's spend all of your money on making this app. It'll be fantastic, everyone will use it. Um, we don't do that anymore at Reason Digital. We actually say, well, hang on a minute, slow down, guys. Cool your jets. Um, we've brought in something called assumption mapping. Um, this was from an NUX uh, workshop that we did um, a few months ago. Uh, it was presented by some guys from Valtech, um, and we loved it, so we're now doing it on every project that we do. And it's essentially a risk management tool. And the way that it works is you have two axes, 
Um, one is urgency, so things that are really urgent. So something, when your app or your product or whatever it is launches, if you don't have that thing in there, it's not going to work. So you put it somewhere on that axis saying, yeah, we really need that, or maybe we don't need to have like videos or some fun music. And then this other axis is your certainty bar. So you make an assumption about this app. Old people want an app. The elderly want an app. The elderly want gamification. You make that assumption and you say, OK, they want that. And you place it somewhere on your uncertainty. Now, this is the point where the client says, we've done loads of research, or we haven't got a clue. Now, in most cases, a lot of clients won't have a clue. They'll have had a great idea, but maybe they haven't taken the time to do that research. However, we were very lucky. This was the first project that we'd done assumption mapping on, and because they were researchers, they were like, yeah, we've got shitloads of research. <laughs> we've got so much research. Now, normally, when you're doing assumption mapping, you would probably find, much like this one, you'd have lots up here in the uncertain, urgent area. We had lots down here in the certain, urgent area. The only things that we were missing were questions about how the app should look, whether illustration would work, whether the right kind of voiceover would work, um, things about how animating the um, instructions would help people, um, that kind of thing. And these were questions that there was no way they would have those answers because they hadn't produced the, the app yet. And that's where we came in. Um, so then after we'd done the assumption mapping, we moved on to David's sector, which was we, ju we had a very short time frame to do this. So we did it in a very quick, very lean kind of fashion. So we jumped straight from assumption mapping to a tool that's called Crazy Eights. Thanks very much. Got Let's give this a try. Can I have the little uh, clicker? Oh, yeah, you can. So I've got this little fancy mic here. So if I'm gesticulating too much, give me some sort of symbol. Um, <laughs> any, any shape, any, any geometry. <laughs> not, not the Antichrist symbol. <laughs> um, so yes, crazy eights. So essentially, we sit around a table. Uh, designers like myself, uh, people from strategy and research uh, departments, developers, project managers, a cross-section of uh, workers at Reason. And as you can see, not all of us can draw. Um, but that's not really the point. Um, Why did you put mine on the top? <laughs> so we, we it's called Crazy Eights because we, we have a piece of paper each, and we divide it into eight. And we, we take a chunk of the potential app, uh, perhaps a screen or a, um, a section that's particularly important. And we say, right, everyone, what, what does that look like? How might that work? Um, it's really fast. We give ourselves about 10 minutes. So it's, it's inexpensive. It doesn't cost as much as a business to do. Uh, following on from challenging assumptions, we're also challenging our own personal ideas and creativity. Um, and what's great about this is it's not just people like me that maybe think they're decent at drawing or decent at designing. It's about uh, other people having their say and getting ideas out there. and a lot of the ideas we went for weren't, weren't done by me, weren't done by a designer, they were done by other people. So we very quickly get a sense of what people think and where they think the app can go, how it can start to, to look and function. So we then, after sort of um, choosing our preferred approaches and consolidating what we think are the best um, types of screen and, and design, uh, be it everything all at once for you to choose, or a very well-paced uh, sequence of events. Um, we then just do a basic map. So ironically, as a designer, I try to design as late as possible in the process, because um, the more work we do early on, the more sketches we do that are very quick and cheap, the more we can get our ideas out there, challenge our assumptions, and uh, progress without actually rushing. Um, so this map follows that philosophy. Uh, it's just a quick flow di diagram. Um, so here we were just demonstrating what the main screens would be, what the actions are, what the route is going through the app. From the home screen, where can you go next? What can you choose? Uh, once you've completed a task, where would you end up? Simple things like that. It's not massive. It's not complicated. but. Uh, gives us a, a better feeling for it. 
Um, again, things come up here. We can show this to the client and we can say, how do we feel this works? And again, we can challenge assumptions. We can see if we've missed anything, uh, any functionality, any screen, any behavior that was expected. Uh, we can quickly and cheaply identify if it's here or if it's not here. It's worth noting as well, at this stage, we were all working together, the whole team. So there was the strategist, the client had helped with the assumption mapping, the designer, Matt, the developer who sat at the back there. Um, we were all involved in kind of helping out with the design process, helping out with that kind of ideas process so that David was able to have a deeper understanding of the functionality because Matt had kind of given his, yeah, we can do that. No, we can't do that. Uh, maybe we can. I don't know how that will look. So he was able to hand that over. And then when David handed over the designs, Matt had a great idea. He, he'd already seen some of the, the kind of designs. He'd got a grasp of the ideas because it's easy to hand over some designs, but grasping the ideas takes a lot more involvement. Um, so it kind of broke down those handover periods and made it a lot easier through the whole process. Also exposes work. It means that people aren't squirreling away and hiding what they're up to. Um, it's all out in the open. Everyone has a common understanding of what's going on, client included. So eventually we get to do something a bit more fun. Um, who's familiar with wireframes? Does anyone know what that means? Does it sound silly? Most people do. You don't. Um, so. Wireframes are something like this. Um, there can be less detail than this. They can look like sketches sometimes. Um, if you're silly, you might go into further detail. So it's starting to look a little bit like an app. You know, we can call this visual design just about. So it's intentionally black and white. Um, it's a basic font. Um, luckily, we had the animator on board already, so we had some draft versions of the animations that we're expecting to use a few dummy icons as well. So we start to get a feel for this thing. Um, but again, we're, we're keeping the detail low, so it's fairly quick to put this together. Um, and we can start to test this in its own way. Uh, we're not worried about brands. We're not worried about colors yet. We're not worried about typography, iconography, uh, imagery to, to too much of a, a precious extent. So it's all quite lightweight. If we need to make changes, we can. It's, again, Quite, uh, quick and cheap, um, but we get a feel for it. And what we do, we uh, put this into prototyping software so we can actually start to, to click these things, uh, try menu items, try icons, um, get a feel for the, for the narrative of, of the app itself. Uh, and then we move on to these. Um, essentially, it just means designs that are more finished. So high fidelity, high detail. We are starting to think about color animation, navigation in a bit more detail, typography. Um, it looks similar, but we're getting closer to something that looks and feels like an app. And again, we get it into our prototyping software so we can have a little click. Um, we go into more detail as well. We, we, we demonstrate more screens. So we're very slowly building a, a picture um, and a structure for this app. And all along the way, we're testing, does it work? Does it do what we thought it would? Is it going to achieve what we're being paid to do? So we then got to a working prototype, which is going to be demonstrated now. Um, so this is essentially the final stage of the project as it stands at the moment. So the project uh, was essentially to build uh, an MVP, minimum viable product. So um, we were hired to test the idea uh, as quickly and as accurately as possible. So let's hope the word working isn't going to become ironic. I'm sure it's going to work. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> um, so what's great about the working prototype is that it's essentially a finished app. And credit to the development team, uh, we turned this around really quick because we had such a great foundation of uh, planning and um, early design, it, it, it came out easy. So do you want to have a little play around, Greg? Yeah. So we've got our home screen here. Um, I'm hoping the sound works. We'll see. So sorry, do you want to just go back a little bit, and I'll just oh. introduce it, and then I'll let you play. So um, basically, what we're, what, what we're assuming here is that there's uh, a sequence of four 
activities on a, on a given day. Um, and in this hypothetical, there's been two completed activities. There's two more to do. So just enough for us to test. Um, not everything is clickable, not everything's finished, but it's a great way of uh, checking that it works. The reason we kind of did this, so there was a number of assumptions that we discussed um, during assumption mapping, which was about uh, encouraging people to use the app, that people would return to the app, um, and that whole element of gamification, and we talked about different things. So the, the kind of daily target rewards was something that through that process we agreed that that was kind of the best solution. Um, that we could, from speaking to Matt, we were like, can we circulate these? Can we give them different exercises so they're not going back and doing the same exercises? Um, so that they can try new things? Um, and can we repeat some of the exercises so that they're getting that um, kind of sustained repeat exercise so that they can improve that strength. Um, so even up to this point, we were challenging assumptions and making changes to the way that we were building the app. So essentially, what this is, um, the, the screen of text and text and text that we showed you earlier, we had to turn that into an app. That was the NHS uh, instruction manual for a, a medical professional to teach someone how to conduct uh, a physical exercise. Um, We've not really talked about those in much detail yet, but um, essentially we're replicating what a medical professional had to do in an app, in a simple app, in a few seconds. So we had our work cut out against us, so uh, should we give it a try? So we're trying to keep text to a minimum, but you know, there's a lot to explain. Here we go. So we've got some nice uh, demonstrative animations, so we're trying to make clear what this physical exercise is going to entail. You'll notice from the uh, wireframes to this, the uh, trainer has actually changed slightly. He's, he's got a little more toned. Um. We had the complaint that he was too fat, so he's essentially lost some weight. So I guess the training works. So yeah, it's, it's all a delicate balance of explaining what's going to happen, making it clear. but. Again, we can't overload with information before the exercise has even started because then that's not going to be retained once the exercise has begun. So um, we did our best to sort of balance the information that we needed to convey. There he is. So what we're essentially saying here is uh, we've <laughs> he's blowing a whistle. Most people think he look, yeah, looks angry, don't they? Um, I could watch that all day. <laughs> so um, what, what, what's also unusual about this is we're now saying, essentially, put your, lap, um, your iPad to the side. So with this app, let go of it. Put your iPad somewhere safe. Make sure it's visible, because you're going to be doing something uh, physically demanding, potentially. Um, and you don't want to be holding an iPad in one hand at the same time. And you certainly don't want to be reading text. So it's at this point that we're trying to sort of launch off and allow other types of uh, communication to, to guide the user. So if audio is working, we'll see if, if the voiceover works. I hope this works. Here we go. So it's nice and big and chunky. Uh, no, you know, very, very little text on the screen apart from the finish button. Should I just leave it on? Yeah. So it's just a repeated loop exercise. So the idea is that we're, we're not trying to create pressure for the, for the user. So it's uh, a lovely, gentle Huddlesfield accent on the voiceover. Uh, and it's a fairly slow animation. Um, probably could be slower, actually. And there's no countdown in terms of you having to race against a clock. It's just try your best, see how it goes. When you're ready to finish, click finish. Again, that was another assumption that we had to. Sorry, I'm going to turn. Sorry, Paul. Um, that was another assumption that we had to challenge. So one of the things was, well, how you know when they're going through the exercise, what do we do? Do we give them a countdown? So we were kind of like, assumption is, you know, at the start we were like, countdown seems like a good idea. It gives them a time to aim for, and then we were thinking. You know, hang on, maybe that's not the best approach. So we tweaked and you know removed that, challenged that assumption, and changed the way that we approached the app as we went along. Um, obviously, you need to stay balanced. You don't want to end up with one like really muscular leg. So 
we move on to the other leg. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> so we've, we've experimented in, in audio communication there, which you know, isn't our bread and butter. But you know, because we were doing a really quick turnaround and we um, you know, raced through our processes, we had a little bit of extra time to, to try the voiceover. So it's a great thing to, to test just you know, as a draft. Um, we asked for feedback. So this is where the app can start to collect data. Um, Eventually, it could feed back to an NHS professional or care worker, a member of family. Uh, and then the app recognizes a completed activity. It can record the amount of repetitions in that exercise. That's just one exercise. You know, there's potentially hundreds of, of other exercises. So that's where the gamification can come in, comparing scores, comparing repeti repetitions. Um, I really want to know what the flamenco exercise is. Flamenco exercise. Something about balance on one leg. Um, should we leave it there, or do you want to go into the hazard perception? No, I, I think we'll leave the hazard perception. Okay. I think you know that's that's the that's the cherry on the cake. We yeah. don't want to ruin it. So that's that's just a very quick insight as to what we did. Um, should we flick back to the presentation? Yeah, I'll work out. Wait, I can I can do this. So we keep saying we the word assumption and challenging assumptions is really important as much as we can, but also, uh, uh, I get my train of thought there. But yeah, uh, so challenging assumptions is incredibly important because um, it, it's just making sure that our product does what it needs to do. So the final way that we actually tested this was user testing. So we're not end users. Um, my legs are strange, but I don't have mobility issues, so I can quite comfortably do those exercises, but some people can't. So we actually, uh, took the app and tested it on real people. Uh, so we went to uh, a care home, the New Charter, yeah. the organization that was re responsible for the, the care home. Uh, so these are two real people, two great characters, and we took them through the app, set them a few simple challenges, actually got to record their, um, their voice and their facial expressions as we were going through it. So a great record of how they dealt with the app. Um, and it's amazing how crazy simple you think your design is and it still might trip someone up. So really, really keeps us on our toes. Um, so we learned a lot from the user testing. Um, and you know, when, when we hopefully work on this app more, there's, there's, there's more to be done and more to simplify, um, which is very tricky. I think one of the um, things that sticks in my mind after these testing was uh, the amount of text on screen. I mean, this one up here is quite a good example. If your eyesight's not great, uh, you can't really read that very well. So, you know, there's still that challenge there. How do we get all that information, all that communication, all that guidance into someone's head so they know what they're doing and can uh, do this exercise safefly? Um, but there were some great positives as well. <laughs> you know, it's really nice when you can kind of, you, been working hard on something and then you take it out and people's faces light up and they love it um, particularly from um, some of the all uh, more able um, guests at the the care home um, from all of them the, the animations were making people chuckle and laugh and you know kind of all these assumptions that we had we were seeing them kind of like proven as we went through the test there was some other more kind of weird edge casey stuff to do with a couple and one of the one of the the wife was blind and i was kind of asking um her husband you know is this something your wife would quite like to do? Would you be happy to take her through it? And and he was like, yeah, yeah, this would be great for us to do together. And there was a lot of lot of kind of comments about it would be great to do it with everybody else um, in the building. And we learned lots of things, some really, really interesting things. So, so our moral of the talk, we've learned lots of things. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so occasionally you have some um, more negative responses. And the last lady of the day, which was this lady's friend, she lived across the hall from her. Um, and this lady was lovely, helped us out. She went to talk to her, and uh, her response was, tell them to go fuck themselves. I don't we, know if that made the report in the end. No, I don't think it did. So do you want to summarize what's uh, the potential for next? So. As I mentioned before, this was a project from the Manchester University. Um, Emma and Paul were 
using our help to create a feasibility study to create an MVP, this prototype, which they're going to be taking around to um, different conferences. There's uh, a health uh, conference in Brussels, is it? I Amsterdam, maybe. Amsterdam. Um, and they're looking for funding. They, they're, they feel that they've proven that this is uh, a workable app, that it can be produced into something that could be rolled out um, to uh, retirement homes, care homes, amongst the NHS. There's a lot of eagerness in the NHS to fund these kinds of projects. So their next step is to go and find that funding with our prototype and with all the evidence. They've got statistical evidence, but now they've got that evidence that we, we were discussing earlier when I said we had the assumption map and we had all that evidence that proved that it was a good idea, but we were missing all that evidence to prove that what we were going to build was a good idea. Now we have that from the user testing. There's still gaps. There's still work to be done. There's still a lot of things that we don't know. But we've got enough that we feel that if they get uh, funding from the NHS, it's not going to be pissed up against the wall on someone's ego project. It's going to be actually spent on something that could make a real difference to people's lives. Now that's a moral of the talk. <laughs> should, we, should we leave for that? <laughs> yes. Any questions? Should we start with Tim? How about you shot up first? Um, so beginning to end, basically. Yeah. Um, about a month. Yeah, I think it was a month in total. So a couple of weeks of concentrated work, and then a bit of a gap, and then and then the user testing at the end. So really, really not much at all. Um, yeah, there was a short gap between. Um, kind of finishing the actual app and then going to do the user testing and then producing the report. Um, so yeah, I think in actual producing, doing the initial designs and then cr cr creating the app, it was probably around about two to three weeks. Yeah, so we sort of, we, you know, try to sort of a agile, light approach and just try to, um, you know, keep, keep each department moving as fast as possible, um, which meant we could sort of achieve a lot in a, in a fast amount of time. Would have been quicker, but Matt's really slow as a developer. <laughs> he's not, he's lightning fast. Is there a question here? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering um, why you only went to the care homes when you already had the product, rather than going to the care homes when you were actually testing the product? Um, well, the assumptions that we wanted to test were the ones about the actual kind of uh, prototype app. Um, we had enough, we felt we had enough research to kind of build the prototype. The, the, the elements that we didn't know were the elements about the prototype. Um, the, 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 the university were in contact with um, the care home and people of that nature, so um, their research was based on that and there were sort of people working with these people daily as well. So um, there was a lot of good information to sort of get started with um, on that front. Um, but yeah, like Greg says, I think it was more the, the functional. I side did of forget to mention actually as well the new charter who are the the uh, care home. They they were also a partner in the project. So um, was, it, was, was it their MD? I can't remember. He Something like that, yeah. yeah, he was he was kind of um, our client as well. So he came and he viewed the app with his knowledge of kind of his industry, and that's why we we were able to have access to that that user audience, which really was really important. Anyone Yeah, that was one thing that we were very concerned about, actually, was um, so the, the instructions that we were following are, are
kind of meant to be for a carer who can guide someone through it. So we were very careful to try and include as much information as we could. Um, I think there's definitely, for, for a lot of the exercises, we'll have to be very careful about how we get the instructions across. Um, there's, even for the one that we did there, there's probably room for improvement, um, but we didn't have the time to be able to kind of put that attention to getting it exactly right. We needed to produce something just to test the, the, the feasibility, the idea that this product would work. Certainly, if we were to go and out and produce the full app, we would have the full force of the uh, NHS and our partners at Manchester University to make sure that it's um, all consideration is given to kind of the health and safety of the people doing the app. One of the big things that came from it was that there was a, a real eagerness from the people working at the care home, people living in the care home, that they could do it as a group. Um, so that would certainly be a way of kind of um, getting around that, that risk element.